Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers, operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and creators of technology advancements and trends throughout the cybersecurity and information system science and technology community. As such, our organization supports those working in cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We provide research and analysis services and help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar and it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity and information systems, science, and technology. Before we get started today, I wanna to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you're dialed in by the phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI Act webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view the webinar PDF, click here. Second, all participants are muted or feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you have a question you'd like to pose for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool, which is at the top center of your screen. It's the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those dialed in on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, check back in a couple of days on the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the go to webinar button will take you to the YouTube link. Uh, with that said, I'll pass it off to today's presenter. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is my name is Tim Denman. I'm I very appreciate everybody being here. I'm actually going to turn off my camera. Uh, I should be able to speak loud enough. I'm going to probably use my classroom voice uh, from DAU, but uh, I will turn off my camera. It seems to be a little bit distracting. Uh, so, so with that, I'm I'm very very thankful to to be here. Uh, just give you a little bit of background of what's going on with with me and what brings me here. Uh, I actually am a DAU employee. Uh, however, I have been asked to be on a developmental assignment or starting in March for six months, a uh, rotational assignment that eventually all instructors from DAU are gonna be doing. Uh, so I'm representing the uh, Zero Trust Portfolio Management Office. Um, headed by Randy Resnick. Very, very happy to be a part of this group. It's, a, it's been a tremendous organization. I am uh, i can't tell you enough how much, how good it's good it's been to, to be part of this and understand what's going on. Um, I've been this, I was a cybersecurity learning director at DAU for the last seven years. Um, and I've, I won't go into any of the other, other, background, but uh, I've had a long, very strong relationship with cyber. Uh, actually, we used to call it information assurance. When I first started, I kind of say I was cyber when cyber wasn't cool. Uh, but with that, I'm uh, learning and growing. And if you don't do that within the cybersecurity area, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And every one of you guys knows that. So I want to ask a question to start this. And if you can respond in the chat room, it would be very, very helpful. Um, 
I just want to ask, what do you see as the foundational principles of cybersecurity? Just kind of, if you can just start posting in the chat, what do you see as these foundational principles of cybersecurity? Okay, good one. I, I see CIA, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability, authentication, training, uh, protecting your data and keeping enemies out. Okay. Uh, keep on. I, I'd, I'd love to see some more. Okay. Uh, I damn, maybe that's I. Okay. Uh, risk management and organizational continuity, trust, insider threats, data security, identity and access management. Uh, really good ones here. One of the ones that I see is least privilege. Uh, hadn't seen that one here, but. You know, again, we don't want people in our networks or on our systems that are unauthorized and, and we don't need people to get into certain areas where they're not supposed to. Uh, and again, that covered in CIA, as you guys talked about mission support, reduce the probability of material impact to my organization due to a cyber event, kind of get into resiliency some of the, in, in some of that. Privilege creep. OK, uh, interesting. Uh, Anything else? I, I like, like these responses. Okay, that great, great responses. Thank you for for that. Um, I will tell you, as I said, I'm I started out this in uh, March, really studying deeply into zero trust and what's going on and where we're headed on this. And I have got a confession to make. As someone who has been in cybersecurity for a long time, uh, on whatever side of side of things, uh, I was kind of skeptical, a little bit skeptical of zero trust. Uh, I saw it as maybe a new technology that we're going to put out there, uh, and it's going to be important that we really push towards this. But I didn't quite understand it uh, when I started. What I've come to understand is that I, I would hope in, in three or four or five years, when I ask you some of the principles of cybersecurity, zero trust is going to be right up there at the top. Uh, I truly believe that, you know, again, we'll, we'll talk about it as we go through this, but this is not a not a fad, it's not a just a one technology, but it's an underlying principle that's got to be put into everything we do as far as cybersecurity goes, or most everything. So I want us to kind of keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, as you notice, the, the briefing title is The Time Is Now, and you're gonna see a lot of new policies, a lot of things coming out within the DOD that are going to reinforce that. And we'll talk about that as we, we go along. So, so the first thing I kind of want to mention is um, we're getting better at cyber is the good news at cybersecurity. The bad news is we're not improving enough. Uh, we're, our improvements are not keeping up with our adversaries. I did a little little drawing up there. If you see it, uh, there's there's them and this is us. We are improving. There's no question about it. But our improvement is not as quickly as our competitors or our adversaries, as we, we talk about. Uh, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, continually confirms this. If you look at what they have their reports and things that they talk about over and over again, you'll see cyber as being on the top of the list. Uh, you know, I, just this quote, the problems continue to mount with some signs of progress, but not enough to keep up with the advances of our cyber adversaries. That's, that is huge. Not enough to keep up with the advances of our cyber adversaries. Um, if you look at what the DOT&E has put out, you know, we see that 
see some of the things that some of the reports and some of the things they put out. Cybersecurity, the most common survivability problem. Although we've seen improvements, the same theme is we've seen improvements, but when we get into a cyber contested environment, we understand that programs are not survivable in, in that in that environment. So as we look at that, you've got to ask yourself, are we getting better? And I, I have been, like I say, I've been involved in cyber. I'm very, very aware of what's been going on. And man, I, I've been uh, up to date on all the, the latest, trying to get up to date on all the latest things that are coming out. But the bottom line is that we have not been proving, improving enough to keep up with our adversaries. So in that context, you know, is zero trust a panacea, a software product or something that's going to solve all my problems? No, it, it's absolutely not. Um, but as we look at it, it is, it is a principle that's got to be interweaved into everything about what we're doing from a cybersecurity standpoint. You know, how do we define, you know, somebody had mentioned there about mission support. Well, how do we define, you know, some of that mission, the protection service? Uh, how do we define the attack surface? You know, it's much harder to identify now as we go to, to cloud, as we go to, to many things that are just, just challenging us over and over again. So, you know, as we look at what we're doing, we've got to understand that exploitation is going to happen anywhere that, uh, Cloud computing, you know, I, I'll be honest. I was one of those who said, oh, yeah, but we don't need to go to cloud computing. Well, guess what? It's here to stay. And we're, we're as we see the boundaries, as we see some of the stuff that's been brought on by COVID, uh, we've gone to virtual networks and all the kind of things, just incredibly, an incredible amount. You know, the bottom line is, our network boundaries are increasingly fluid and the perimeter defenses are not working. People are going to get into the system and we've got to understand that. As I said, zero trust is not a one size fits all perfect solution, but it is something that we've got to, to bring in into all we do. So again, I, I like the, the quotes and, and some of the things here, you can, you can read them. I'm not gonna share every one of them, but as we look into this, as we, as we go forward, <laughs> we say, hey, well, great. Zero trust sounds like a good idea. I'm going to recommend that my program buys the necessary software and the problem will be solved. Oh, wait a minute, that's not gonna do it. There's some products and technologies that definitely have to be. We couldn't do zero trust without without some of those things. However, it's not it's not a technology. It's not something that's going to be achieved only through new technologies. It's not a capability or device. And I, I really like uh, Mr. Resnick's quote. It's not a capability or device you buy, rather it is a security framework, an architectural approach, and a methodology to prevent malicious actors from accessing our most critical assets and reducing existing attack surfaces. Not something that you're gonna buy, although the methods are gonna include some, some things like that, the process, everything else, but it's a whole paradigm shift. It's going to be, be looking at how we take our defenses from a static, just looking at network-based perimeters. Some people we'll call it the castle and moat, moat to, uh, to focusing on our users, our assets, our resources, and our data. 
you know, our data is really, really important as we look at this. So, I, I want to, to stress, and you can read, read the slide, but the big thing is Zero Trust is focusing on protecting the critical data and the resources. It's not just the traditional network or firm for security. Uh, it used to be, we used to hear this, well, trust, but verify. And eh, that doesn't really go in. It basically, don't trust and verify is what we're looking at here. Every step along the way has to be verified just because there's so much potential within the cloud and within other areas to, to have a breach of what's going on. Uh, I want to share with you, I don't know if any of you guys saw the movie, but there's a movie way back in 1992, and I won't, I will not uh, play the clip. I don't, don't have permission to play the clip necessarily, but uh, Sneakers in 1992, Ben Kingsley, ben Kingsley was the bad guy. His name was Cosmo, and uh, Marty was uh, Robert Redford, and he was he was the good guy. And some a few things that Cos said that really stick out. 1992, the world isn't run by weapons anymore. It's run by little ones and zeros and little bits of data. There's a war out there, old friend, a world war, and it's not about who's got the most bullets. It about, it's about who controls the information. See that over and over again when you look at um, the, the uh, war, war and when you see like Ukraine, what's going on with Ukraine, the first things that attack is the cyber defensive. And we've got to understand what are we trying to do? We're trying to protect that information, the resources, the data, not just looking at the, the perimeter security that we once did. So you know, we, we, as we look at, look at this, yes, information is everything as we're, as we're going through this. So the question you might have is, well, what is driving zero trust? What is trying to pushing us down that road? Well, the first thing I'll say is uh, industry has used it effectively. You see this through Google. You see this through a lot of different areas. They're using it effectively. Uh, and we, I will say it's not a new concept. It started back in 2004 uh, with uh, the Jericho Forum. And... Uh, uh, John Kinderbag, uh, something like that. Uh, in 2010, he first coined the phrase "zero trust." Uh, so it's not it's not necessarily that new. However, as technologies have enabled it, again, not technologies have, are not the the answer and not as a single solution. But as technologies have enabled it a little bit more and more, we have, we, we've been able to move towards this more and more. And the DOD and the government in general has recognized, and this is not a partisan matter. That's one of the reasons I, I really enjoy being in cybersecurity. I don't see it so much as a uh, part, partisan matter. I see on both sides people understanding this is really important. Uh, but as I look at this, uh, Executive Order 14028 was kind of, you see that at the bottom there, that kind of uh, started the a lot of the things in motion. Obviously, there were many, many uh, organizations that were already going towards this, but this is the first thing that we really saw said, you're going to have to take some more steps. We're going to have to see those steps. Uh, one of the quotes, and this is very consistent with what we've talked about before, it, it says, incremental improvements 
will not give us the security we need. Okay, understand that. Let me say that again. Incremental improvement in cybersecurity will not give us the security we need. I believe that's that's dead on. It said, goes on later, talks about modernization, and it says the federal government has got to adopt best security, best practice, and advance towards zero trust architecture. And so you'll see a lot of these memos and things that you see here are follow follow up to that to that original executive order. But the main thing is we've we're, we're, we've been told a line's been drawn in the sand. We've got to tr start moving towards that. There's there's responses that were due from the services, uh, and part of the response has been uh, in the stand up of the Zero Trust Portfolio Management Office, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But as we look into this, uh, as we go forward. Uh, there is no turning back. You know, I, again, this is going to go. My my strong feeling is it's it's going to go through what it, it's it's not a fad. It's going to go through any organization, through through whatever administration we work into that kind of stuff. It's something that that we're going to see more and more and more, and the the government orders here are just are just asking that. We, we start quantifying, we start showing what we're really doing there. So as we look at that, the, uh, and, and this, I, I will tell you, uh, NIST Special Publication 800-207 has some excellent resources out there. I mean, it's very, very good type things that are going on with that. Uh, You'll see some uh, a, a lot of other other things from federal government responses. Uh, a lot of it comes from NIST. Some of it needs to be specific to the DoD, and one of those is the zero DoD zero trust reference architecture. And this is really important to understand. Uh, version 2.0 of that reference architecture was signed uh, on July 14th. So uh, a week ago, uh, Thursday, so six days ago, it was signed. It's kind of interesting. I really appreciate the, the people, uh, the, the, the people that are helping help set this up from uh, CSIAC. Uh, they they work with me because I said, hey, I need to change some slides here, kind of at the last minute. Uh, but you understand why at the end of the day on Thursday, we get this new policy out. And we're going to see some of that. There's a lot of changes, a lot of things, but but I, I believe we'll see a consistent direction going forward. Uh, so if you look at the reference architecture, there's, there's some NIST guidance that talks about tenants. There's some other guidance that talks about that, but I really like the way it's explained uh, through the through the uh, through the zero trust reference architecture. And that is assume a hostile environment, presume breach, never trust, always verify, scrutinize expli explicitly, and apply unified analytics. Uh, remember Back to that quote from Sneakers, it's all about the data. And somebody said information is everything. Uh, I really uh, I have to agree with that. Uh, the, the thing that you understand, because it's all about the data, encryption is not optional. It's mandatory. Uh, as we say, there's certain things, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I have seen some uh, organizations, not necessarily DOD, but some organizations jump up and down and claim that they have zero trust and look at the great things they're doing on zero trust. And I read it and it's like, wait a minute, that's not really zero trust. Uh, so 
we're one of the things that's got to be done, and and I hope this uh, this is part of that uh, is just understanding. Let's get a common lexicon. Let's 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 go forward understanding what zero trust is and zero trust is not. And uh, so the basic tenets from the DOD reference architecture, I believe, give you some some pretty good guidelines there. And we'll go into each in a little bit more detail. Excuse me, I'm going between a couple of computers here. So the first one is assume a hostile environment. Uh, that's not really hard to do. Uh, you know, we used to talk about, I don't know if you, you guys remember the concept of war driving. You know, that's uh, not, not needed. Not, it's not necessarily we see war driving a whole lot. However, the act, what was war driving? It was the act of, of uh, locating and possibly exploiting connections to wireless local area networks while driving around a city or elsewhere. On the cloud, you don't really need to do that. But you are finding, finding vulnerabilities. You're finding ways to get in. Just... Again, I don't think anybody should could dis disagree that the first with this first statement that you know we do have a, a hostile environment. The second area is presumed breach, and actually going back, I thought this was really interesting. I, I read the full quote uh, from Robert Mueller, FBI director, back in 2012. Uh, I'm convinced that there are only two types of companies, and that could be networks or systems or organizations, whatever. But I'm convinced that there are only two types of companies, those that have, have been hacked and those that will be. Okay, that sounds, okay, that sounds, okay, I can kind of see that. But listen to this. It says, okay, those that have been hacked and those that will be, and even they are converging into one category, companies that have been hacked and will be hacked again. So basically, uh, I, I think that was a pretty good quote and it's definitely come true that there's we, we have to assume a breach because basically you've either been hacked and you will be hacked again, but there's, there's no chance, especially within the DOD, that people don't care about your data. Uh, just just say that just understand that uh, so the next the next tenet is never trust always verify and that goes back to to what we said before uh, the problem a lot of times with our system systems is we we've, we've given access by default and we can't do that anymore so as we look into this as we go forward uh, that that's again has to be kind of at the center of all that we're doing, and uh, yeah, I'll answer some questions here later. Um, the next side of things um, is all resources. And this is talking about scrut scrutinize explicitly, and we got to look at our resources, and we have to continually assess them we have to reassess them and we have to look at the access to those resources it's got to be a continual continual look fortunately we we don't have to uh we don't have to sit have somebody that just is stuck in a boring job uh we we have automated tools that do that, and, and as mentioned, uh, we're you know we're going forward. You know we'll we'll talk some more about those, and I have some good questions which I answer at the end. Um, but again, scrutinize, go go forward, look at to the access to the resources, and understand that not, no none of that access should be just a carte blanche. Uh, the other part of that is unified analytics. 
Uh, let's study behavior, log transactions. As we mentioned, uh, you know, some of the uh, some of the tools that we have are going to help towards that degree, but that's that's also going to be extremely important as we're looking forward. So you'll this is again from the zero trust reference architecture. If somebody asks about making it available, I will uh, I will send it to to Phil. And we'll we'll get that one, but it, it should be available on the. Uh, CIO's website too. But when you see zero trust, you're going to see it expressed often related to pillars and capabilities. Uh, this is a logical way to, to, to pre present it. And as I said, one of the, the things that we really have to understand is. Zero trust, um, a lot of people are going to claim to have zero trust and, oh yeah, I got it, we're good, we can move on to the next thing. Uh, that's, it's something that's going to be continued to go on. Uh, and, uh, I, and Bradley, I do see that on your, uh, on your chat. I'll get that to you uh, here. Here, here a little bit, if, if, if not. Um, but as we continue down this road, uh, we have to understand how do we how do we best communicate it. And so uh, there's pillars; uh, those are key focus areas that were that are designed for implementation of those controls. And then we'll see talked about in capabilities. Uh, you know, a set of activities. How we're gonna, how we're gonna get to uh, to that to that level, to to certain level of uh, maturity when it comes to zero trust. Um, you'll see this chart, um, and uh, as you look at that, um, I, I, I kind of want to go over each of the the layers each of the pillars and if you notice which one's in the middle uh you know it's the data and uh there's a reason for that you know as we as we look into this uh the data is what we're trying to protect we, we can't we can't forget that so the first thing is the user and the biggest thing is um we've got to monitor access we've got to look at access patterns we've got to continually authenticate that the person is who they say they will they are you know I, I i can't express enough how easy or how how many different ways we can get into a system now we can get into a network with with cloud you know it's no longer about defining a perimeter and you know, we, we can't let anybody inside that perimeter. Uh, we, we still have to work to define a perimeter, but we, we also need to understand that, that the difficulty of that has gone way, way up with the cloud computing, with our VPNs, with everything that we're doing, which uh, we, could, we could choose not to do those things. Uh, and like I say, I might have advocated for that 10 or 12 years ago, but uh, we, we, I think COVID has shown us that we can't choose to not do those things. Um, so as we look at this, um, the, the, next part, the, the next part after user is devices. And you know, that's probably the, the, one of the obvious things that we really have to be, be aware of. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I end up doing a lot of my work on the phone. Uh, and that's not calling people, although sometimes it is, but it's in texting, it's in accessing email, it's doing a whole lot of things there. And so we can't just, we, we've got to understand the health, the vulnerabilities, and the status of all devices. 
I, that's, that's really important as we look into that. You know, another pillar as we look at zero trust is we look at the applications. We, we talk about the workloads, all those type of things. Uh, everything has got to be secure, you know, including including uh, the applications, including the virtual machines. We've got to look at how how secure those things are. Uh, we, then, we then have to go to the da data itself, and we've got to know that that's at the center. Uh, we can't forget about encryption. Uh, it talks about here ro robust end-to-end -end encryption and data tagging. You know, I, I just, uh, I'm very... You know, I don't think any of us are are lacking with the data that we can have access to. It's what do we do with that data, and and that's that's some things that we we really have to look at with, with zero trust. Um, the whole the whole idea of network and environment is uh, extremely important, and maybe I'll, I'll share a little bit of, of something as I go into this. You know, you've really got to, you hear a lot about zero trust architecture. Uh, and I, I've chosen not to, I don't use that as much as I just use zero trust because I'm talking about this as a whole, as a, everything holistic. But zero trust architecture and the zero trust reference architectures, as you'll, you'll see, is extremely important. It's about how you build the system, uh, how you how things are laid out, uh, segmented. You know, we, we, you'll hear the term micro segmentation. Uh, somebody talked about resiliency earlier, and uh, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll say something on this. Uh, as you get as you're more and more as you go through zero trust, you understand that it does provide for much more resiliency. Because first of all, if you architect your system the way you're supposed to, with micro segmentation, people, adversaries that get in can be discovered quickly because they're in a smaller segment of your, of your network or, or system, whatever it may be. So they're in a smaller segment and they can only move within that segment. So you can find them quicker, you can isolate, and you can recover quicker. So if, if, you're, if you're worried about resiliency, uh, the, the, there's great benefits from uh, the zero trust architecture uh, as we look into it. Uh, you also look at automation and orchestration and visibility and analytics. The main thing I want to say there is we have, uh, and, and again, it's one of those things when it came out, you're like, yeah, this is not, not good. But uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we've got to use those things. We've got to be able to analyze. We've got to be able to improve continually. And AI and ML have got to be kind of at the, at, at, a, at the center of some of those things, you know, use those enabled processes for security. All those type of things are, are super important as we look forward. So those are the things that I really, I wanted to, to highlight as far as the, the pillars, the tenets of zero trust. Uh, but I, I just want you to, to understand that it's going to, it's coming. Uh, that it's uh, it's a lot more than a fad. One of the things I thought about doing at the very beginning of this is uh, also ask you all the uh, different things that you've done uh, for that are fads that for cybersecurity that haven't worked. And this is again, this is something that's been been in the experimental stages, been concepts been thought of since 2004 we've been working on it it's been worked through government through through commercial through the industry it's not perfect but the whole mindset is the way we have to look at i believe cybersecurity.
We have to assume there's no implicit trust. We have to, again, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen um, people, you know, whether it be program managers or whatever, get some, some exceptions. And maybe they don't have that, that most of them, none of them that I know I've had, had bad intent, but their understanding of, of cyber and what they could bring to problems they could bring, they were not, they, they brought in some great problems uh, because there was some implicit trust granted that should not have been. Uh, the other thing, you know, I want to, want to leave you with is we are improving <laughs> at cybersecurity and, and many of you guys are in the forefront of that, but not enough. Uh, I believe as we adopt this mindset and as we're going forward, I believe that we can, it's heading us in the right direction. And I'll, I'll just tell you this, if you say, if you, if you, if you agree with the statement that we're, we're improving, but not enough. Um, and if you don't necessarily think zero trust is where we need to go, uh, I'd ask where, where can we go? What else can we do? And, and I think, again, it's not a one, it's not a one size fits all. It's not a single solution. It's something that we have to work, work towards. And so, I'm really, uh, uh, really passionate on that. And, and I have to tell you guys that, you know, I told you at the beginning that I started with the portfolio management office back in March. And I couldn't have told you at that time that we've really got no choice but to go in this direction. But as I've considered the many years of cyber that I've gone through, the many failures, the, the great efforts, all the hot things that are happening, uh, it's, it's what, we, what we have to do. And uh, as I say, I think there's a lot of people that agree with that and we're gonna see that. Uh, I wanted to just kind of tell you some stuff that I'm doing. I won't make this long at all. Uh, but I'm working on a foundational executive and practitioner level course on this. I'm working with a, with a team of stakeholders. Uh, like I say, there are some people that are really, really smart in this area. Uh, and I think you're going to, going to see some really good, good products coming out. So, uh, look for that. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to be hosted. Uh, yet, but we'll have we'll have something on that as, as we're looking forward on, on this. Uh, but the foundational is just going to be for anybody within the workforce, the executives, obviously for the for the executives and the practitioners are is going to be a. And I'm really excited about this one. Uh, actually, the hours are going to be. <laughs> there's going to be more hours involved and. I'm actually looking to bring those dates in to have that ready. We're going to be doing for the practitioner course, we're going to be doing a one and a half to two day workshop. Uh, it'll be for 20 people each. Uh, it's going to be piloted through, uh, through the Navy. And uh, then we want to pilot it on, with each of the services. And doing that, we should get something out uh, really maybe quarter two of FY23 is, is what, we're, what we're looking at. So we're looking to bring those things in as, as much as possible. And I will tell you that uh, we, we've made a lot of progress in all the areas there. Um, the last thing... Um, that I have to share besides just questions is the, what the PFMO is doing. As I said, I, I, you go long and far to find anyone that, that, that's, that has a, that says these guys don't know what they're doing. Uh, 
I, I really believe some of the best of the best are involved here. Uh, Mr. Resnick, Randy Resnick has done a, a tremendous job, uh, but it's a very new organization, very newly established. January 31st of this year, it was established. It's, it's growing. One of the things, as we said, the, uh, the reference architecture uh, came out, uh, version 2.0 just came out. The big thing I want to make you aware of and, and look at as we're going for this, and I'm sorry, but there's there's courses of action. They're going to tell, let the services know how it's not going to dictate. The services have have options as far as how they want to implement this, and there'll be courses of action that, that they're going to work through. Uh, but the zero trust strategy is Final is in final approval stages. Uh, we're hoping that that will get out in August. Uh, I understand how how some of those uh, those things have uh, come come about, but but this one is this one is extremely close. Uh, it's kind of funny. Um, I, I, I kind of laughed at you know the, we heard about the RMF and when it was going to come out and. And then we heard about RMF 2.0 uh, this morning. I uh, just saw, uh, I believe this is right. I, I saw someone in an email that the RMF 2.0 has come out. So uh, I, I bring that to say that, uh, you know, looking into this, the zero trust strategy is going to be key. And you're going to, as you look into that, look for it to come out in the August timeframe, as you look into that, you're going to see some, some major, major issues, some major, some major, uh, milestones, uh, some ways that the services are going to have to work for zero trust. So with that, um, I'm, uh, I, you know, I finished my presentation. We got uh, about two minutes over, um, uh, but, uh, we've got about 13 minutes for questions, and uh, Bill, I'm not sure how we want to do that. Uh, I see a lot of great questions here. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, very informative. I uh, also think very timely based on uh, the fact that version two was just released. Um, so now we'll, we'll start the Q&A. Uh, I'll read the questions out loud uh, for the benefit of those over the phone, and then we can just step through them one by one. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? I, I missed. I missed that. Um, we're going to start the Q and A uh, portion now. Um, so I'm I'm gonna bring up the questions and then uh, I'll read them out loud for the benefit of those on the phone, and then we'll just step through them one by one um, for 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 the rest of the time that we have here now. So uh, we'll we'll get started with the Q and A now. Um, so this is our first question. Um, I I believe I did put this in the attendee chat. Um, I can put it in there again. Um, just go back to the CSI website uh, with this webinar. Uh, the slides are up there and they're available right now. Um, in a couple of days, we'll also have the recording and the, and the link to YouTube so you guys can review this on your own time. Uh, I believe you touched on this as well, but Bradley asks, do you have a link to version two of the document? Yeah, let me see if I can find the link. I have the hard copy and, and Bradley, I can... I can uh, make that available to you, but there, I should, you're right, I should be able to find the link on that. Okay. Our next question comes from Ron. He says, does the communication encryption mandate apply to operational systems? This could degrade operational performance of the system. There may be better risk mitigation controls that maintain performance requirements. Um, as I as I understand it, if you don't have encryption, uh, you don't fully have zero trust. I understand the degradation of performance possibilities, uh, but those, you know, again, the those can be. I believe some of those risks can be mitigated by um, just the way the system is designed and, and uh, 
just, uh, you know, looking at focusing on the data at rest, those type of things. So um, from my standpoint, I don't think you fully have zero trust until you have that encryption. Uh, can you do a lot of zero trust principles uh, and, and not have encryption? Yes, but I, but I don't believe you fully have it until you have uh, encryption. So ho hopefully that answers your question. And by the way, uh, I think maybe the best way to do it is uh, I can I can send you my email and uh, I would love you know if you have follow up questions. I, I realize that I that I'm uh, I, may, I may not answer things completely. I may not understand the scope of the question or or whatever. Uh, and, and if I do that, or if you just have follow-ups, uh, I will, uh, be, be very happy to, I mean, I'll send it to the, to the rest of the team and, and they can, uh, they can do probably do a lot better job of answering it than, than me. So, so yeah, but, but, but bottom line is encryption for, for true zero trust, I believe you have to have, uh, data encryption. Thank you. Our next question, this sounds like a requirement that needs to be heavily funded and automation provided from top down with a zero trust implementation plan. It sounds like control and compliance on steroids. That is another cyber do this. But with that, but with what you have, it is no different than what has existed in the past, just directly. Wow. I said a, a huge concern and uh, I would have probably uh, agreed with that fully uh, uh, several months ago, uh, but the bottom line is what we're doing is not effective enough and we, we can do this we can, I, I believe this can be done. I think the technology is there uh, to do it without, without, uh, again, if it, and I'll say this, I hate the compliance mentality. Um, I, yeah, I just, I think it, we, we just got to continue to, to, to understand this is a, this is something that's never going to be fully reached. But that's why I brought it up at the very beginning. I don't see zero trust as something that we're going to comply with, and all of a sudden our systems are going to be perfect. Uh, it is it is something that we're going to have to we're going to have to ingrain into everything we do from a cyber standpoint. And uh, I, I like I say, if there's a better way, uh, I you know, hopefully we can you can. Others can share it, but but I just don't see it at, at this point. And again, I'll be happy to follow up on some of that. Uh, I, I I don't discount your your question or concern in any way, and I'd love to follow up on that if, if you if you want to do that. Thank you. Our next question from Keith: Has the zero trust wrapper architecture been developed in a tool? Cameo Enterprise Architect, Sparks EA, other? I, I do not believe so, but I don't know the answer to that question. I have not. Uh, I mean, I know it hasn't been widely distributed uh, as a tool. And, you know, we've declared victory. It's too, too much in the early stages. Again, 2.0 just came out. Uh, last week so the answer would be no but can it be uh, uh yes it can be to a certain extent uh, the only problem i will say with that is sometimes you know I've, you've, i think everybody has seen it where we can uh we can have tools that we think are are going to do everything for us that we're supposed to have done and there's just nothing like nothing out there like that. And there never will be because it's, again, more than just a tool or a technology. Okay. All right. 
Is your zero trust capability maturity model captured in a document that we can review? I believe you kind of addressed this already. Yeah. Um, well, the capability, the ZT capability maturity model, um, I, I will tell you there's a lot of mature zero trust maturity models out there. The zero trust strategy will uh, lay that groundwork, but a lot of different different capability maturity models. Uh, and to me, there's some confusion there. Uh, but I, I would say look to the the, re the zero trust strategy that comes out in August, uh, hopefully in August. Our next question from Bill, with the policy to implement zero trust, is there resources to modify existing data systems to meet requirements? Is EDH a means to implement zero trust? Um, this was a, a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I, the answer would be yes. Uh, we have, well, are there resources to modify those data systems to meet requirements? Um, there, there, I'm sure there's some resources out there. But as this gets gets going, my thought is that it's going to be there's going to be some major major shifts and changes there. Um, the so I mean so I think it's going to be an evolving set of set of resources is is kind of where I said enterprise data headers uh, can help. Yes, uh, no no doubt they can help. I don't see them as necessarily a means to implement it, but that's, uh, you know, as you, as, again, you're talking about protecting the data and as you, as you can, you know, and one of the things you talk about is visibility and analytic, analytics. And uh, that's, that's what, what Zero Trust is all about. So EDH definitely will help towards that, towards that goal. Okay. Thank, thank you. Our next question from uh, D Hippo: Without resources to back this, is it just another grand concept? I've been doing this a dozen years, and this has been a model, but there just aren't enough resources or experience, and this only requires more time, more education for non-cyber and greater audience. RMF will work, but it was poorly implemented by organization leaders with no cyber understanding. It includes these concepts. Um, you know, I, I, I will say, and I, and I, I'll have to violently agree with you. You know, I, I uh, I've heard it said, uh, you know, in some, in some ways, um, uh, I've heard it said that, you know, uh, if you want to idiot proof that, you know, how can you idiot proof a system? Well, it's basically, uh, it's, it's, you're always going to be finding bigger idiots, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I agree, uh, that RMF has come out and, uh, it's not designed to be a checklist at all. It's, it's, uh, the, the whole idea on it is not risk elimination framework where you say that you're going to, to go and, and get all the risk and, and just just solve everything. No, it's managing those risks and working within that model. But but the main thing is understanding those risks. Uh, but but again, if it's we have leaders that have no cyber understanding, uh, you're gonna be there's gonna be some major, major issues. Uh, I, I do believe RMF uh, may include some of these concepts, but it doesn't take us there. And like I say, if we don't get there, uh, 
we're going to have some, uh, it's, it's just going to get worse and worse. So can we have, is, are we still going to have stupid people doing stupid things? And I hate to say it like, like that. And the answer is yes. Uh, but I believe this is going to take us to a better state. Just like, uh, I, you know, I don't think anybody could argue that we haven't made improvements in, in, in cybersecurity. And we're not in a better state than we were 10 years ago. This, this is going to take us to a, to a better state. I believe, and you know, maybe we can have this discussion in ten years and and see if I'm correct. But uh, but I do believe the concepts are, are right. Uh, but I, but like I say, I don't I don't dismiss that because it is a huge concern. And I've seen it. I've seen it over and over again. Okay. Thank you. Uh. Appreciate appreciate that comment. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, some compliments coming through as well. Uh, our next question from Scott: How will this impact other federal entities, uh, DHS, that want to autonomously access DoD data repositories, especially those that want to incorporate those into their enterprise systems? Uh, this is a, this is a really good question. Um, first of all. Executive Order uh, 14028 was not a DOD executive order that we mandate zero trust, or that we not mandate, that we advance toward zero trust. It was a, um, it, it's a federal uh, executive order. Uh, so, I will tell you, and, and I've worked with a lot of government agencies, DOD and non-DOD, I truly, I honestly feel like the DOD, uh, as behind as we are, uh, I think we're farther along than many of those agencies. Uh, so there is going to be some challenges there. There's, there's, no, there's no question about it. Uh, but uh, we we should at least know that the federal agencies are are working towards that end, uh, and we'll uh, maybe that's and Scott maybe that's something we want to uh, uh, go go with for you know look look at a little bit further on that and, and uh, could, yeah so we'll go ahead with that. Thank you. More compliments. Our next. Uh, I like. I like. That's a great question. Um, I would love to come back and do this for uh, CSIAC. I'll be happy to do that, um, and maybe get somebody that's that's uh, somebody else from the PFMO. Uh, so I'll be very happy to do that. Um, I will also tell you that one of the things I'm working with, going back to DAU, going back towards DAU on this, is a we have stuff called rapid deployment training, and uh, where we insert it into our classes, and uh, I will probably be doing some webinars and some things like that on there. Uh, actually, I've got I've had access to the um, the uh, the strategy that's you know that, that's that's in review right now, and so I've already got the, a presentation ready. I'm just going to have to edit it when the strategy comes out. So I should be able to get that done real quickly. Uh, so so yeah, thanks. Very good question there. Perfect. Just for the benefit of those on the phone, uh, Victoria's question was: Can you give a follow up presentation after the August release of the strategy? Um, and we, we have it on tape. Tim says that uh, he'll be back giving us another presentation or somebody from, from the Zero Trust office. So uh, we look forward to that. Um, our next question from Richard, what is the transition period from traditional to hybrid Zero Trust? Will there be, in effect, two different architectures running in tandem? I, I've got to... Um, uh, Richard, if you can send me an email on that. 
uh, that would be better um, probably answered by uh, some of the the PFMO leadership on that one. That one's a pretty, uh, um, I'm not sure what kind of trans, how, how that's going to, that's that's going to go and and i think it's my 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 best thought on this is uh <laughs> sorry this goes back to an old da dau answer and i and i apologize uh, which is it depends i, I believe that um uh, there's going to be a uh, a lot of different um it, it's just some some are going to take a lot longer than others uh some are going to be going to be reasonably quick, I think. But but please ask me that question again. I'll give you a better answer. All right. Our next question is: How is a new architecture to be implemented when cybersecurity items and concepts consistently fail to make it into engineering requirements, fail to be given priority by program leadership? and fail to be implemented in any capacity that couldn't be considered rework under the current cybersecurity frameworks, under current security frameworks. Wow, you've, uh, you've given a, a, a tremendous question and that goes back to in, in what I would tell you is probably the, uh, the biggest challenge and the the, the thing that comes up more than anything else when we try and do anything within cybersecurity, you know, our contractors look at, you know, our defense contractors look at this and they say, where is it on the contract? And uh, that's, that's a, a huge concern. Uh, we, we've i've tried to one of the things i've tried to do a lot is work with uh contracting uh people and really talk to them a lot about uh about putting cyber security you know it's just not enough to say you will implement zero trust or it's not enough to say you will uh put in you know, cybersecurity or, or the risk management framework, follow the risk management framework type thing. So you are you are spot on that requirements are are really important. I, I've said it oftentimes, uh, contractors live up or down to our expectation and we communicate those expectations in a contract. And uh, so, you know, as you, as you look at this, uh, uh, and, and I, I will offer this up, uh, I, you know, DAU does a lot of workshops and I'll be going back to that position, uh, you know, at some point here. Uh, but with those workshops, um, we, we, have, we have tried to help with the contract people in, in some of these areas and I'll be happy to, to go back and help on that. Thank you. Uh, more compliments from Dave. All right, great. And, and I believe I believe that's all of our questions for today. I know we went slightly over, but I think it was well worth the discussion. Uh, this was a, a great presentation. I think it was timely with the release of version two. Um, looking forward to the Zero Trust Portfolio Management in the DAU course. I think that's timely and, and applicable. Um, in, a, in a prior life as a DOD civilian, I remember when I think DAU, I think uh, acquisition courses and system engineering courses. So I think having something uh, targeted a little bit more towards the cybersecurity professionals uh, would just be, would be a great help. But uh, Tim, thanks again for your time. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out to CSIAC. Again, check back on the website. Those slides are up there now. The recording will be up in a, in a couple of days. If you have any other questions for Tim, feel free to reach out to CSI and we'll make sure uh, we make that connection. Uh, thank you. Hopefully we'll see you next month for our next webinar. You guys, excellent questions. Thank, thanks so much for, for everybody being, being involved and uh, 
like I say, uh, look forward to, to kind of, this is going to be a, it's going to be a challenging journey. Uh, and I look forward to kind of working it, working it together with, with a lot of really sharp people. And I appreciate what you guys are doing.